Hello everybody and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I'm your host Alice Hanoff and today we are going to be reading another short story from my prequel to my debut novel The Head to Heart in the Air. So this is the prequel book The Spare Who Became the Heir. You can find it on Amazon and all sorts of different um, online retailers or in hardcover signed in my bookstore at alicehanoff.com and today I'm going to read you the second short story in the book. So the we already you can go back and I will link it. You can watch the video the Re becoming a returned one which I already read out loud and posted and then today we're gonna read book number two or story number two which is with great power comes nagging brothers and this is another one from Alex's point of view so <clears throat> let's begin shall we spring 1544 run faster Alex ran as hard as her legs and lungs would propel her. Branches bit her face and ripped out her clothes and satchel, but she wouldn't let the spring foliage slow her desperate steps. Each day for the last year, Ian, Stefan, and Michael had been training her to protect her herself. She could now fight a little, ride bareback, use a bow almost as well as Graham, and run like the wind. Today, she needed that speed because a life depended on it. As she leapt over a rotten log, her magical pendant that disguised her as a boy clung to the sweat on her chest. The disguise wasn't at all that impressive. All it did was make her wavy chestnut brown hair short and rusty red. Stefan assured her that as she grew into womanhood, it would seem more impressive. That's what Daniel had told her on the day she arrived at the house of Stefan's family all those years ago. The prince had ordered them to keep her safe and never tell a soul who she was. Alex burst out of the trees and barreled towards Kirsch. The old wooden bridge outside the town bounced as she thundered across it before reaching the worn dirt road that led into the heart of the small village. Alex ignored the various onlookers as she made a beeline for the inn. Ian was in town today, learning how to manage the inn from Royce, the father of his sweetheart, Irma. She knew she would know where Ian was. Alex dodged the miller who was arguing with a carpenter about when he'd be available to fix a rotten beam at the mill. But in her haste, she ran into the apothecary, nearly knocking him over. Look out, Alex, he shouted. Sorry, Francis. She threw open the inn door and tore into the room. Weaving through the table, she bumped into a group of mostly blonde young men crowding around the bar, talking to Royce. Watch where you're going, boy, a middle-aged man said. Alex looked up at the blonde-haired man who bore the Dayton Knight's crest. He had green eyes and Alex smiled. Green eyes were rare in Dayton. So whenever she met someone with eyes like hers, she remembered. The boys looked at her and snickered. What are you laughing at? Mm -hmm. Alex spun toward them and scowled. Dressed as simple peasants, their clothes were all wrong, clean and in perfect condition. Alex's shirt was stained thanks to its previous owner, Michael, and she had patched her pants from when Thomas had fallen out of that tree. She rolled her eyes. Rich young men dressed as poor country boys? On her right. Every April, Dayton would take junior knights from the castle in small groups and drop them off at various villages, and they would then work together to find their way home. If they returned within a week, the reward was priceless, an opportunity to train as a royal guard, the most prized position in all of Torian. But if they took too long or got separated, the most they could hope for was to become knights. Most were sons or nephews of royal guards and used to living in luxury. The real challenge was being stripped of money and status and having to rely on their wits to succeed. But living in Kirsch, Alex knew the truth. Over the years, it had become a complete farce. The villagers all knew who they were and helped them, though tradition kept the boys in the dark. Another stupid date in tradition. Alex growled at the three boys who had snickered at her clothes. The fourth one didn't even notice her. He stood next to the knight, scanning the inn with a wholly disinterested look in his eyes. Good luck with the honor right, she told them. If you're going to need it, if you can't even fool a poor boy from Kirsch. Slipping under the bar, Alex rushed over to Royce. Breath finally slowing, she blurted out the entire story. Michael fell off his stupid horse again and it bolted. I think he broke his ankle or worse, and I can't carry him. I need Ian. Where is he? Before Rice could answer, another man replied, the lads could help you. What good would they be as knights if they don't help a young boy in trouble? Thank you, but my brother's enough, Alex said, turning toward the older man. Her stomach lurched as her heart stopped. The man who had spoken had black hair and a dark complexion. He stood beside the other senior knight dressed in the same fancy kind of crested nightshirt, but he bore the crest of another kingdom, not Dayton, but Warren. His face was one Alex would never forget, the king. 
When he smiled at her, an ice-cold shiver crept up her spine, bringing to mind the terror of the day she fell through the ice. He looked so much like her father to begin with, the same dark brown complexion, the face she missed and dreamed of so often, but the smile especially made her want to cry. The eyes were a different story, however. Her grandfather's were dark, rich brown, while her father's were blue like the sea beside their home. Before her stood the man who had taken her mother's life and forced Alex into hiding. He stared at her, oblivious to the terror raging through her, antagonizing her with her father's smile. The King of Warren had disguised himself as a knight. She gulped. A familiar heat soon replaced the cold flooding her veins. She tried to calm the pounding in her heart. Breathe, he can't tell it's you. She turned to the young man beside her. Thank you, but I'm fine. Her voice trembled as she spoke. These boys are hoping to be royal knights one day. Helping people is what we train them to do, he said. Irma appeared in the kitchen doorway. Then they shouldn't be laughing at a peasant boy's hand-me-down clothes. Royce looked relieved to see his daughter. If you get these fine men some lunch, I'll fetch Ian from the butcher and we'll get Michael. Alex, where did he fall? By the giant mossy rock. Ian knows the one. Perfect. Royce ruffled Alex's hair and moved around the bar. Go into the kitchen and get yourself some lunch. You're growing like a weed. Alex didn't need to be told twice. Once the door swung shut behind her, she let herself fall apart. Six years I've been hiding and he shows up. The one time Stefan stays home. Breathe, no magic. Panic soon engulfed her as her breath quickened. Then mercifully, a pair of loving arms wrapped around her. Father and Ian will find Michael and bring him home. You don't have to be scared. Alex turned and hugged Irma back, releasing all the terror about her grandfather, all her fear for Michael after he'd been hurt, after he'd hurt himself. Irma rubbed Alex's back for a few moments, then turned toward the pot on the fire. The inn's kitchen was small with a work table and a smaller one beside the back door that led to the well. Alex took a stool at the larger table and watched Irma scoop stew into bowls. Grab me seven loaves from the basket, Irma said, pointing at the smaller table. Alex picked them up. Wait, seven? Irma winked as she grabbed six and placed them in the basket before handing the last one to Alex. Then she placed a finger to her smiling lips. Alex couldn't help but smile as she took a massive bite. Can you give me some apples? Alex mumbled before swallowing. Once the bread hit her stomach, she sighed. April meant the stores they'd saved for winter were running out and a full belly was a rare treat. What? Irma asked laughing. The tradition, you sneak them food while the old knights aren't looking. Thinking of her grandfather made her appetite disappear, but she forced another bite anyway, not knowing when she'd get a loaf to herself again. Grab the bags by the door. You can sneak into the stable and hide them on their horses. It'll be obvious which ones. You can tell a parlay and course here from Alonsi, can't you? Alex narrowed her eyes and tilted her head frowning. Sorry, Irma laughed. Alex looked at the pile of heavy bags inside. I almost forgot, Irma said. Your book arrived. The plant book? Alex perked up. She had been waiting months ever since Michael had left her copy outside the night a storm rolled in the camp in January, soaking it so much that half the pages stuck together now. She rushed towards the bag and found her book under them. Thank you. Irma smiled and picked up a tray that was laden with bowls of steaming rabbit stew and bread. Alex added the book to her satchel, hoisted the four burlap sacks to her shoulder, and slipped out the back door, hurrying to the front of the inn. She waved at the blacksmith before slipping into the stable. Even Michael could tell these horses. The local horses all had standard saddles. Plus, they were dirty from the recent rains and looked gaunt. At the front, however, were six of the most beautiful horses Alex had ever seen. The leather on their saddles was so polished, Alex could see her reflection. She ran a finger along the soft surface and nearest the saddle. Must be nice to be rich. Two black horses had fewer supplies. They lacked the rolled up blanket and the brown and gray horses had. Alex began lifting the saddlebags loaded with supplies and tying the burlap sacks under them. She found a good place on the third horse to hide the bag when someone ripped it from her. What did you steal? Alex looked back at the pale blonde boy. It was the one who hadn't laughed at her clothes. He wore the fine, his were the finest of the group and Alex remembered how the general had stuck closest to him. Your clothes are extra fancy. Is your father an earl or a royal advisor? I didn't take anything, she said. Alex lunged for the bag, but the boy lifted it high enough that she could not reach it. Crossing her arms, she frowned. Being this small is annoying. If we were at my camp, I'd punch you. But if you cry, my murderous grandfather will come out and I can't risk him recognizing me. Alex swallowed to hold back her fear. The boy sneered and then peeked inside the bag. His eyes snapped back to her widening as he scrunched up his nose. There's food in here. Alex held up the last bag before tying it onto the horse. 
Of course it's food, it's tradition. The grown-ups pay double for lunch and we sneak food onto your horses so you don't starve. No one actually expects you to survive alone in the bush. Excuse me? Alex held her hand out for the last bag. He handed it over and then crossed his arms and glared. Alex was defiant. Excuse what? Did you fart or are you sorry for being a spoiled knight son who can't take care of himself? No! She couldn't help chuckling at how red his face had become. Reaching into another bag t tied to the third horse, she pulled out a mushroom. Then how do you explain these? We're allowed to forward on the way here. Lucas collected those barons where? They're poisonous, Alex said. The boy flinched when she held the underside up to his nose. Gray underneath is fine. Black is poisonous. These are all black. You would have puked your guts up and then shat yourself to death. The boy's blue eyes were wide as he groaned. You can't be older than eight. What do you know about forced plants? Alex finished tying the last bag before pulling her new book out of her satchel. When she looked up, her breath caught in her throat. Daniel now stood beside the boy. He smiled from ear to ear as he pointed toward the boy and back to himself several times. Daniel never spoke, though he communicated with her through motions. Today, she didn't need them. The resemblance was startling. Now her grandfather dropping off these boys made sense. The boy was Prince Aaron, Daniel's younger brother and the sole surviving heir to Dayton's throne. He was the boy she played with while their mothers visited each other and their fathers were off fighting against the Petruger. The boy she'd once considered her best friend, a title that had since transferred onto Michael before her mother's death had ripped them apart. She wished she could reveal herself right then and there. Instead, she clutched her book and made an impulsive decision. Daniel vanished, still smiling at his brother. I have a talent for plants, so obviously you need this more than me. And with that, she handed Aaron the book. I can't pay for this. Those are the rules. No gold. I've lived here long enough that I know the rules. How long? I'm almost 11. Not eight. Then why are you so small? Alex already knew she was scrawny for a girl her age, but as a boy, she must have looked downright tiny. You wouldn't care. We're poor. There isn't always enough food. Prince Aaron had always been thoughtful, but years in the castle would certainly have hardened him, Alex thought. But as he looked her up and down, her cheeks warmed. Why? he asked. Dayton has so much farmland. There should be enough food to go around. You live near the castle. How did you? Only nobility and night sons take the honor, eh? In the south, the crops grow better. Up here, the storm kills most of the plants. What's left is expensive, so kids are smaller. Why don't your parents ask for help? Alex looked down, kicking some hay. My father isn't here, and my mother's dead. Aaron's face went pale. I'm sorry. It's fine. My brothers and I take care of each other. But with so many of us, if we can't forage or hunt enough food, we don't eat. Winter's rough, but come back in the fall and we'll all have put on a good amount of summer weight. I can't take this book. Aaron held it out to her, but Alex shook her head. It's fine. I have another one. It's just old. Those three you're traveling with are idiots. They'll get you killed. You must be important, so that would be bad. Why do you say that? Because your card is coming to check on you. When you get back to your easy castle life, remember not everyone in Dayton has it as good as you. Aaron turned to the inn and Alex slipped out the stable's back door. As she neared the front door, she could hear Aaron talking to the knight about what he'd learned from her, asking if it was true. Alex snickered knowing she'd put questions into his head. She hurried back to the inn to get her rabbit stew. She'd finished her second bowl when Royce and Ian arrived with Michael and Stefan. Michael had only sprained his ankle, but he got a nasty bump on his head. Ian rushed to camp to get the wagon, but halfway there, he found Stefan already coming with it. He'd been searching for Alex and Michael. When she spotted Stefan's pale face, Alex knew they'd seen the knights leaving Kirsch. Without a word, he grabbed her arm and pulled her out of the kitchen and into the major stretch of town. It was still afternoon, and with everyone at their jobs, the streets were quiet. Skies were darkening, a storm was barreling down from the mountains, and Alex's stomach flipped at the idea of having to tell Stefan what had happened that day. He nodded to the odd villager who passed by, but never released her arm. Stefan led Alex to the bridge overlooking the Darren River, where no one could hear them speaking. He knew she liked to watch the water even after what happened on the ice. After a few minutes of watching the ducks on the riverbank, he spoke. What happened today? Alex swallowed hard and leaned on the railing, keeping her eyes on the ducks. Methodically, she told Stefan about her day, leaving out the part about seeing Daniel and talking to Aaron. When she looked up, he'd gone rigid. He was here. Your grandfather was in Kirsch, Stefan asked through rasping breaths. Alex nodded. I don't want to talk about him. A familiar combination of worry and determination marked his face as he grabbed her hand, pulling her from the bridge so hard she almost tripped. Let me go. We have to leave. Get you back. Hide you, he said, tightening his grip on her wrist. It's fine. He's not coming back. 
Stefan spun around, eyes narrowed, and leaned down until their noses almost touched. And how do you know that? Because he disguised himself as a knight. He was here for the honor right, and now they've left. He won't be back. Why would the king come for the honor right? Alex tugged on her shirt hem and looked down. Because a crown prince needs a general and a king to take part? Stefan's face went ashen as he released her hand. Arthur and Aaron were here? You saw them both? Alex gulped. I talked to Aaron. You did what? <laughs> he didn't recognize me. I had my pendant on the entire time. I didn't realize who he was until we were alone. He followed me to the stables when Irma asked me to tie the secret food back. Alex, he didn't know who I was. I gave him my plan book and he left. It took us forever to save for that book. I know, but they picked black bush mushrooms. They'd have gotten him killed and he's my friend. Or was. Stefan groaned and ran his hand through his hair. He is my father's responsibility, not yours. I know, but no, Elizabeth, no buts. Stefan only used her royal name to make her quiet, but today it wouldn't work. Her temper was roaring to life and she took a moment to steal herself from their inevitable battle. It was my book. I'm allowed to do with it what I want. You didn't want to make the trip into town with Michael in me, and now you're mad at me because of how I handled myself when something goes wrong. I was alone because you weren't here. Michael got hurt, and when I saw him, you're lucky I didn't send everyone flying across the village. Not so loud. Exhausted and frightened from everything, Alex grumbled as the storm's rain fell on them, soaking her on top of everything else. Alex hadn't even gotten to talk to Michael before Stefan had dragged her from the end. Her temper was flaring as heat spread through her abdomen. Stefan opened his mouth to speak but stopped. Alex glanced down at her glowing hands. No, not again. As she glared at Stefan, lightning cracked beside them in the river. Alex cried out as a massive gust of wind blew her to the other side of the bridge. The rain came down in sheets as thunder rumbled. Stefan rushed to her and grabbed her shoulders. Alex, calm down. Stop telling me what to do! Alex ripped herself from Stefan's grasp and shoved him as hard as she could. She caught him off balance and he stumbled. As she thrust her arms out to keep him back, an intense heat she'd never felt before flooded her arms, making them glow brighter. And just as Stefan opened his mouth, lightning struck the river again. Alex screamed, pulling her still glowing arms back. Across the river, the mill erupted into flames. The heat in her arms became so intense that her sleeves remained dry despite the pouring rain. Alarm bells sounded as men raced out of every building. Stumbling backward, Alex bumped into Ian and Michael. When Michael squeezed Alex's shoulder, the gold color left her arms. She watched in horror as the winds intensified, further engulfing the mills in flames. You have them, Ian shouted over the noise. Go help Royce, Stefan barked in reply, pulling Alex between himself and Michael. Leaning against the bridge railing, Michael grimaced, trying to hide the pain as he grabbed Alex's hand reassuringly. Villagers rushed around trying to extinguish the fire. They had built the mill along the water so the river's power could run the millstone. But even with the men along the river passing pails of water down multiple lines, the wood was burning too fast. Stefan? Alex asked. No, but absolutely not, Stefan said. Alex put her hand on his elbow, but he quickly shoved Alex behind him. I can help, she whispered. Alex, be quiet, Michael said. Peeking around Stefan, Alex spotted the miller, and in that moment her heart sank. Despite his home and business burning to the ground behind him, his wide, terrified gaze remained locked on them as he stumbled backward. He saw, Stefan whispered. Just then, Ian hurried over. Already drenched from helping with the fire, he pulled Alex out from behind Stefan. Weather, premonition dreams, and now fire? How are we going to hide this one? Ian asked. I don't know, but we're going back to the camp now. Stefan's voice broke as he gave the order. But look, so you want to ride in the storm? Ian cursed as he scooped Alex up and started toward the stable. Michael limped after them, helped by Stefan. Am I in trouble? Alex asked, terrified to hear the answer. No, unless you use them on purpose, we'll never get upset at you because of your powers. They're part of you. But we will need to keep you away from town for a while. What about my knitting with Irma? Alex asked as Ian stood her beside the wagon. You're worried about a scarf? You set a mill on fire! I need to get you back to camp before people ask questions. Alex swallowed the lump in her throat. I never get to say thank you to Stefan for helping me every time I mess up. I just want to give him something nice for once. Ian turned to her. I'm sure I can convince Irma to come out and help you once things calm down here first. Michael and Stefan arrived and Ian helped Stefan get Michael into the wagon. Alex climbed in beside him. She couldn't stop thinking about the fire and worrying about what this new power would mean for them all if she couldn't get it under control. 
I wonder if it's possible to lock your feelings away. I hope you enjoyed short story number two from The Spare Who Became the Heir. And make sure you subscribe so that the next time when I read story number three, you won't miss it. Have a good day. Bye.